how does a donut turn into love handles? Let's talk about that. How's it going guys? My name's Richie Kerwin, and if you've ever wondered how you end up wearing that delicious meal you've just enjoyed, well, you're in luck because today we're going to take an in-depth look at how the food you eat gets transformed into the fat you store on your body and how that builds up over time. We'll also answer some important questions like do all carbs get turned into fat immediately? And if you're on a low carb diet and your insulin is low, does that mean you won't store any that fat you eat. Now, there are a few different factors involved in how we store body fat, and we're going to talk about these factors so you have a better understanding of why body fat storage happens. To help with that, I'm going to use a good old burger and a fizzy drink to break down what happens to carbohydrates, proteins, and fats in your body after a meal. Let's start with carbs, which are going to make up the vast majority of the calories in the burger bun and pretty much all of the calories in the sugary drink. When you eat, starch, a type of complex carbohydrate, starts getting broken down by amylase, an enzyme in your saliva. Carbs also get broken down by similar enzymes in your small intestine just after your stomach. Starch and any other carbohydrates like sugar get broken down into simple sugars of which there are three types, glucose, fructose, and galactose. Glucose gets absorbed through the wall of your digestive system into your bloodstream and gets transported all around your body. This is because glucose is one of your body's primary energy sources along with fatty acids, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Fructose gets absorbed directly through a vein called the portal vein and gets delivered directly to the liver where it can be used as energy. And if it's not needed for energy, it gets converted into fat. We'll talk about how that happens in a moment. Now, when you eat most carbohydrates, like I said, glucose gets released into your blood and your blood glucose levels go up. The problem is your body likes to keep the amount of glucose in your blood nice and stable. So if your blood glucose gets too high, body will release a hormone called insulin, which brings your blood glucose back down. Before I go any further, it's really important to say that if you're healthy, you don't need to worry about your blood glucose rising after a meal. That's completely normal. And as long as you're healthy, your body can bring that glucose down to normal levels quite quickly. Spikes in blood sugar are supposed to happen when you eat carbs. And it's only a problem if you're metabolically unhealthy and can't bring the glucose level back down quickly enough. Now, like I said, Insulin's job is to lower blood glucose, and it does that in a number of ways. Firstly, it increases the burning of glucose for energy, and it reduces the burning of fat to get your body using all that excess glucose floating around in your blood system. Then, it also causes your body to store more carbohydrate to get glucose out of circulation. The liver and your muscles can convert some of the excess glucose into glycogen for storage. Glycogen is a polysaccharide made up of loads of glucose molecules stuck together as chains. When we need energy later for activity, we can break down that glycogen into glucose again. The average athletic male, for example, who weighs about 70 kilograms, has about 600 grams of glycogen stored in their muscles and liver. The more active you are, the more glycogen you can store, which is one of the reasons being physically active and having plenty of muscle is good for blood sugar control. Now, if your muscle glycogen stores are full, and if you don't need to use the extra glucose in your body straight away for energy, your body still needs to get rid of it somehow, and it does that by a process called de novo lipogenesis. That's just a fancy way of saying that your body converts glucose or any carbohydrate-like substance into fatty acids. Those fatty acids get transported in your blood to adipocytes, a fancy name for fat cells. Once inside the fat cell, the fatty acids combine with a molecule of glycerol to form a triglyceride, otherwise known as fat. Your fat stores are an amazingly efficient way of storing energy in a small space. And an average 70 kilogram person with about 15% body fat or 10 kilograms of body fat mass has about 90,000 calories of stored energy. Now, here's something really important to understand about de novo lipogenesis. It's not a very efficient process. In fact, as much as almost 25 to 30% of the energy contained in carbohydrate can be lost in all the enzymatic processes that turn it into fat. That means storage of fat from carbs is only 70 to 75% efficient. And because of that, the body is more likely to burn carbs for energy straight away than store them as fat under normal conditions. Now, let's move on to the meat in the burger, and importantly, the protein. Protein digestion begins in the stomach with an enzyme called pepsin and continues in the small intestine where other enzymes break that protein down into amino acids. These get absorbed in the small intestine and transported in the blood around the body. Normally, amino acids are used for protein synthesis, like building muscle, and other important functions like making hormones and enzymes. However, during times of excess protein intake or low energy needs, amino acids can be converted into glucose through gluconeogenesis. This means that the nitrogen-containing amino groups are removed from the amino acid in a process called deamination. The amino group is eventually converted to urea, which we pee out in our urine, and the rest of the amino acid is converted into glucose, which we can use for energy. If there is still an excess of glucose beyond what your body needs for energy, it can be converted into fat 
through de novo lipogenesis, just like I explained for carbs. But under normal conditions, as in someone isn't eating way more energy than they need over a long time, we don't convert much protein into body fat at all, far less than carbs. Time to talk about the last macronutrient in that burger, fat. The fat will be found mostly in the burger patty itself. And once you eat it, the fats are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol in the small intestine by enzymes called lipases. From the small intestine, fatty acids get absorbed into the intestinal cells where they recombine to form triglycerides, a fat molecule, again. Now, because fat doesn't mix well with blood, those triglycerides get packaged into little particles of fat called chylomicrons, which are similar to the particles that transport cholesterol around the body. Those chylomicrons don't get released directly into the blood and instead are released into the lymphatic system, which is a whole other network of vessels in your body. From there, the chylomicrons eventually enter the bloodstream. Once in the blood, the chylomicrons can supply cells around your body with fatty acids, which are a valuable source of energy. However, if your body doesn't need the energy right then and there, it has to get those excess fat particles out of circulation, and it does that by sending them to fat cells for storage. Remember when I said that the conversion of carbs to fat was only 70 to 75% efficient? So the body doesn't do it that much under normal conditions of energy balance? Well, converting the fat you eat to stored body fat is about 98 to 99% efficient. Yup, you heard right. It is incredibly easy for your body to store dietary fat as body fat. Now, does that mean that eating fat makes you fat and eating carbs doesn't? No, that is not what I'm saying. You see, what we haven't really spoken about here is energy balance or how much energy you're eating compared to how much you're burning. If you're eating just enough calories to meet your energy needs over the long term, you won't store any extra body fat. That doesn't mean you won't store any body fat. You will, and in fact, we are more or less continuously storing and breaking down body fat over the course of the day. That's why it's calorie balance in the long term that makes a difference to whether you gain or lose body fat. So if you eat more energy than you need to burn over the long term, whether it's fats or carbs, you'll end up storing more body fat. If you're eating a diet with normal levels of fat and carbs, you'll just store more of the fat you eat because your body tries to burn more carbs when you eat them, but it can convert excess carbs to fat too if you eat enough. And to clarify, the single biggest determinant of whether you'll store body fat or not is the total amount of calories you eat. If you eat more than you need for long enough, you'll be adding more body fat. Now, there are a few other interesting points about body fat that are worth mentioning. I've mentioned in a previous video on why it's so easy to gain weight that the human body is incredibly efficient at storing body fat. And if you eat enough, your body fat stores can just keep growing, theoretically indefinitely. Fat cells can either increase their size a lot in a process called hypertrophy, which is much more likely when we overeat, or they increase the number of fat cells in a process called hyperplasia. This process is called adipose tissue expansion and means that body fat stores just keep getting bigger. Now, your body prefers that most of the fat is stored under the skin, which is called subcutaneous adipose tissue. But after a certain point of body fat gain, your subcutaneous fat stores start to reach their limit and body fat starts getting stored ectopically, which means it gets stored in places you don't want it to, such as visceral adipose tissue around your organs, in your liver, and even inside your muscles. When body fat starts getting stored ectopically like this is when a lot of health problems associated with excess body fat start to happen, such as insulin resistance, fatty liver, and increases in chronic inflammation. The thing is, everyone seems to have a different point at which they start storing body fat ectopically. So some people can gain a lot of body fat without any health issues initially, while others might start having problems at relatively lower levels of body fat. This is called the personal fat threshold, and it's studied a lot in research around insulin resistance and diabetes. Now, just before we finish up, I want to touch on another common myth about fat storage. I already mentioned that insulin is an important storage hormone. When you eat carbs or protein, your body produces insulin, which increases the burning of glucose for fuel, reduces the burning of fat for fuel, and promotes the storage of carbs and fat. Hearing that might make you think that insulin causes people to gain weight and completely stops fat loss, but you'd be wrong. The thing is, insulin only has those effects when its levels are elevated, and insulin is only high or elevated for a short time after you eat, at least in healthy people. So after a couple of hours, your body goes back to its normal state, which includes burning fat, which it can take out of your body fat stores. And don't forget, we usually spend a lot of the day not eating food, including those eight hours at night that you should be sleeping, which gives your body plenty of time to use all that stored body fat. There have been plenty of experiments that have shown that weight loss is still possible when people eat diets that increase insulin secretion, such as the famous rice diet of the 1940s and 50s, with over 90% of the diet's calories coming from carbohydrates. Even in a study of high carb plant-based diets versus low carb keto diets, despite the fact that the high carb diet led to higher glucose and insulin levels, people still lost more weight than the keto diet because they ended up eating fewer 
calories. And at the end of the day, when it comes to fat storage, what matters most is how many calories you eat. And don't let anyone try to convince you otherwise. So we've covered a lot about how your body stores body fat after you eat, and I really hope it's helped clear up any myths you might have heard about it. As always, if you have any more questions, let me know in the comments below, and remember to like and subscribe to the My Protein YouTube channel for more great evidence-based nutrition information.